And while we're talking about pesticide use, this is something that's interesting to me because you were in a very heavily managed um, land area. It would be much more akin to the Great Plains, um, you know, Kansas, Iowa, those areas in the states where where I'm at, there's not a lot of row crops just because we're so hilly. You know, you'll have cleared land in the river bottoms and on top of the ridges, and that's about it. Everything else is on a slope. So we don't have a lot of crops that can receive pesticides. I'd say sweet corn. If you get over in West Tennessee, that changes. You'll have some cotton over there. Um, you know, I, I know down south, uh, cotton and maybe some fruit crops, but where where are the biggest problems in pesticides as far as crops? And also, I'll say that in the South, mosquitoes in cities are a big problem because they, they spray oh, yeah. for mosquitoes in, in Southern cities. So I'd say that's a big problem, but specifically what crops do beekeepers need to be watching out for? That's a really good question. And it's, it's not an easy question to answer because there's a lot of dynamics happening here. Um, low dose uh, exposures, how to, exactly does that uh, affect the overall health of the bee and the performance and everything that kind of comes together. So it's not an easy question to answer, but it's a question, it's a situation that beekeepers have to manage. Um, to be able to extract that huge crop that you're talking about here that we have available to us, we have to be able to um, expose our, our stock to all those uh, toxins, I guess. In yeah. Honeybee is like extremely efficient um, in uh, uh, metabolizing toxins. It's just the way they're like little dust mops. Eh? So they're always bringing everything that's in the area back home and they have to deal with it back home so they have a very efficient way of uh detoxifying these substances substance, substances <laughs> but when we start compounding the you know we have in hive products that are chemicals too and we start using products that maybe interfere with some of that detox systems uh it just it doesn't allow them to be able to manage all that exposure all the time so as a beekeeper i'm looking at it uh, and as a farmer too, <clears throat> I mean, I'm using these products, I'm putting them on the pro on the land. And just how do you find that balance between uh, the amount of products to put on the land and trying to minimize my honeybees from the exposure of those products? Uh, and <clears throat> I, still, I still don't have an answer to that other than just maintaining uh, good beekeeping husbandry back home uh, focusing on bee health. I've, I'm a huge proponent of feeding uh, supplements just to make sure that the bees have everything they need to build to uh, manage their development in a very uh, stress-free environment. So like a, an animal that's not stressed will not fall to diseases or other types of stressors mm -hmm. as, as easily. So, you know, focus on the health. And by doing that, you should have a healthier bee to be able to withstand some of those exposures. Also, if we see risk within the area, we don't take the bees out there until we see the opportune time where we can then take them out, extract the crop, and then take them back out again. And I'd say more so in the spring, maybe there's this whole uh, whole neonicotinoid issue with bees and 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 health problems and such. And I don't think I really see a problem with that, but one of the ways I maybe manage that issue is I keep my bees in the spring within areas of lots of natural growth. So mm -hmm. they're up in the trees maybe more or in the uh, pasture fields in those uh, early flowering crops, you know, focusing on their development in areas around the intensive agriculture. So they're not exposed to the neonicotinoid and the dust and such, and they're not caught up with having to travel across the field and have that exposure. So I kind of remove them from that situation. And then uh, throughout the spring into summer, then I start migrating my hives into the areas of those managed crops to be able to then extract that uh, honey crop off of, and then take them out, bring them back into this secluded areas 
of yeah. natural growth to be able to manage them for winter. So I'm trying to strategize my management of the placement of my apiary uh, to minimize those risks also. Yeah. You know a lot more about individual crops than I do. Um, I've, I've got some exposure and some basic knowledge, but I want to ask you some questions. Field corn these days, most of it is going to be GMO um, and it is pest resistant. So you don't see field corn getting sprayed much at all with pesticides these days. Sweet corn, uh, you probably will still see some of that in sweet corn. Cotton, uh, yes, you will see some pesticides sprayed on cotton. Think about the other big crops that make honey, um, sweet clover, alfalfa, canola, sunflowers. Um, which of those do you have to watch out for getting pesticides? And are there any that you don't have to worry about? Well, canola, we have to worry about the diamondback moth and birther armyworm. And that's a problem yeah. because they... Well, they, they drift up on the wind from the southern states and they, they kind of drop onto our fields right on time for flowering. So they, they start completely decimating the crop right at the wrong time. And farmers will, you know, there was an epidemic back in the mid 90s and they, we could, farmers could not keep ahead of it. And they're just spraying, you know, from morning to dusk all through the day, mm. right through the bloom. And it, it was pretty tough on bees during that time. Sunflowers, uh, you have... You got to you have to control all the bugs within the head itself to preserve the seeds, and more so to the confectionery type sunflowers because they're edible. They're they're for human consumption, yeah, you know, those yeah. spits and such, so they can't have any imperfections in that. So that, that a lot of those companies mandate a spray of two times through the bloom period. And if the bloom period is like ten days, maybe twelve days, that pretty much and capsules that entire flowering period so those bees can't get away from that exposure so the confects hmm. are really tough on bees in that aspect and they use a higher residue spray but the oil types they we seem to be able to get away from that a little more because it's more directed towards uh oil market where they they crush it or a bird seed market yeah and so they're not as fussy of the bugs in there so there's crops we've got to stay away and alfalfa can be tough uh, the ligus bug gets in there and kind of nips the flower off. So the farmers have to spray sometimes and the alfalfa, you know, they're again mid bloom. So it, if we can just manage these risks across the land in a certain way, so we just minimize the risk to their bees. I tell the guys spray in the evening. I, I try, tell them not to spray in the morning because the morning doesn't work for farmers either. You, you spray in the morning or midday, that sun's going to decompose that product before it's actually you know, is able to kill the bugs anyway. So I tell them to spray in the evening, mm -hmm. spray in the evening. My bees are usually away and that gives all night for that chemical to work on that crop. And by the time the bees start flying the next day, if there's any residues within that field, it almost seems like the bees can smell it and they'll, they'll mm -hmm. stay away more so than being directly uh, influenced to it. Right. So evening spraying is a lot easier on hives and such. But if, uh, if the guys can spray these uh, products that are pollinator safe, like I was um, uh, talking about earlier, uh, the guys are spraying for grasshoppers and canola. And so I told them to use this product, which is uh, it kind of directly uh, focuses on uh, grasshoppers and worms and it locks their jaw so they can't eat. Hmm. Uh, it's just a different mode uh, of... Uh, of, you know, killing the bugs and it doesn't directly affect the bees. Uh, so we think anyways. So if they use this product can very sp specifically focus on those insects they're trying to kill, then in a way it, it helps us manage that exposure issue, whether or not completely manages, but helps us manage some of that issue. And we get into, uh, you talk about GMOs and you talk about uh, seed treatments and those are very tough um, topics because it, there's a lot of emotion behind that and there's a lot of narrative behind that issue too right gmos and seed uh, it's, it's almost like one of those things that people try to politicize oh and it's uh, have, for have super strong opinions about one way or the other yeah and, and you can understand beekeepers being in one camp or being drawn to one camp because in a way we are so connected to the land that we are environmentalists say and, mm -hmm. and if you don't have that 
foot in the door of development and such is really easy to you know just kind of sit in one chair and argue one point and push that narrative across and i'm not saying it's a bad thing it's just when you look at seed treatments it's, it's allowing us to manage our crops to uh, focus on um, specific uh, problems insect problems without having to broadcast a generalized spray over land all the time. So what it's done for our farm is it's allowed us to relieve some of that overland spraying, mm -hmm. non-discriminate spraying, and it's allowed mm -hmm. us to keep it, you know, more so focused on the pest we're trying to, to kill at that time. And so I see that as a, as a positive and same with GMO cropping it, it, it aside of the whole issue of GMO. Yeah it's allowed us to manage our farm more efficiently so that we're so that we're not having to use more chemical product overall which then you know our bees are less exposed to that overall product that we would otherwise have been spraying across our landscape mm -hmm. there is a huge uh sidebar to that though is <laughs> and i don't know how far down this rabbit hole you want to get but <laughs> <laughs> once you start allowing farmers or providing farmers with all these tools they start doing their job extremely efficiently they you know they're bred to grow that crop nothing but that crop right so yeah. everything else around them uh it's monoculture and bees need diversity to be able to survive so you know i always chuckle and i, I don't think any farmer is going to be listening to this but you know that farmer that is not a really good farmer, maybe a little bit lazy and, you know, rough around the edges, has all those weeds across the field that beekeepers thrive on. But you have that farmer that's very OCD and specific and he knocks down every tree, fills in every slough and drives straight lines regardless of how he travels down that field. I mean, there's nothing in there for the bee to survive on. It's like a living desert, right? Until the crop blooms for three and a half weeks and then then again it's gone so that's what gmos has provided farmers that's the biggest disadvantage of it and it's that's the hardest actually if you ask me for all the chemical exposure bees have the probably the biggest problem uh is uh that gmo aspect of this whole equation just because of the very it allows farmers to manage the land that removes absolutely all the diversity. And that's the biggest consequence to our hives and just maybe pressuring their nutrition. And they're not as nutritious anymore, or uh, not as healthy anymore because they're lacking nutrition. And because they're not as healthy, they, they just opens themselves up to the exposure of disease and, and other types of pressure, pressures like that. You know, that's really interesting. It, are the GMO crop, is, is the mechanism there because the GMO crops are so much more productive or so much tougher that farmers are putting them into what used to be marginal land yeah. that would have been not been cost effective to get planted. Um, and now they're able to capitalize on that, on that land. Absolutely. And we're seeing the same thing with the cattle farm in a way is we're losing our pasture land, land that was maybe not as profitable. We could acquire for a cheaper uh, price or we could even rent the land for not a lot of money because it's not as productive. We have equipment now that are at our fingertips. Most farmers now have a high hoe and there's, I don't know, there's four different tile drain companies within this area. We're dropping plastic tubes down to the ground to be able to pull down that water pressure to allow these huge pieces of equipment to go over and start far farming all this land. We're, we've, it's, there's guys pushing hilltops into valleys just to smooth it out so they can travel the land and it's just absolutely amazing but the consequence of that is we're just losing all those natural pockets of diversity which i mean nature needs right yeah so i guess you, you know you look at that this problem that's unraveling itself and you look at our farm maybe falling down that same trap as we focus on development and the efficiencies of managing this property and such what are we doing to be able to offset to provide that balance to keep my bees going because it's very important that i have that diversity to be able to maintain my stock we can't supplement our bees to be able to fulfill their complete diet we need that natural aspect that natural you know that pollen has that factor x that we can't we can't seem to supplement they need that 
spirit of nature to be able to sustain themselves mm -hmm. and develop. And we need that from pollen. So how do how does our farm then find that balance? And we do it in little places. We do it um, around the edges, I guess. Like I don't try to focus on the infield of what Adam's doing because he needs to do what he's doing. We need to be profitable. Otherwise, we're going to be broke. Otherwise, I'd be talking yeah. to you like this and I'd have a day job, right? It's just <laughs> we have to <laughs> we have to realize the pressures of of the the economic situation in front of us. So we have to embrace that in a way. But around the edges, you know, those little aspects, uh, maybe we don't need to fill those sloughs in. Maybe we contain one or two of them here. Um maybe we can preserve the ditches like that seems to be a huge opportunity to me because the farmers don't own the ditches the society up here is the crown so mm -hmm. if we can maybe put a little more effort into uh, managing that square grid right across the entire countryside maybe manage it a little more creatively to provide more diversity to provide that aspect of pollen to all those living insects right across the countryside there's an opportunity there our farm has, I think it's about 500 or so acres of virgin land. It's a ravine, really tough land to even pasture. So we're just, it's sitting there and we're just, we just want to preserve that because we appreciate not only its natural sense, but it, the ex extreme amount of value that provides my bees every spring. It's just that yeah. glut of springtime pollen I need. And that's kind of where I ref put my bees back in the spring as my refuge. We have like uh, conservation efforts to manage uh, water runoff here, a little bit hilly, uh, a very unique uh, landscape we have. We have this um, area around Miami. It's an ancient lake bottom called Agassiz, just this ancient as flat land. But then our farm is just up on top of the shores. So there's a 200 yeah. foot drop in elevation and we're kind of in the <clears> hills. The majority of our farms in the hills but in the spring, after all the snow, snow starts to melt, there's a tremendous amount of water flows down and causes huge amount of problems with uh, washing out roads and, and erosion, all this kind of stuff. So what we've done is we've built a number of small dams up here just to hold back that flood water. So, you know, this Conservation Act we're, we're using to build to uh, protect ourselves from that threat of, you know, water runoff. But we're also using these little dams as... Uh, wetlands and refuge for you know ducks and other other creatures that need water we need water across the countryside for anything to exist right we need bees yeah. especially need water and they all fly miles to go get it so we need these little pockets of water all the way around the place too uh, little things like that and then we step right into the development where i just kind of encourage the way he manages land with chemicals just uh you're going to use heat treatments that's fine um, if you're going to be doing overland spraying let's try to focus that on the evening so we have a great big sprayer probably uh, oversized for the farm but it allows us to get our work done quicker because we want to condense our work during a smaller period of time later in the day right so we focus our chemical use in that way and uh, if we have to spray mid bloom like we do in canola sometimes when these bugs appear diamondback will drop onto one of our fields we see you know the crop being lost he'll spray with products that are pollinator safe and mm -hmm. it seems to provide that buffer so you know it's not one thing is going to happen but we just do a whole bunch of separate things all at the same time yeah. just to help preserve that aspect of it one uh... then i get into what i'm doing as a beekeeper and this is the important aspect also because I have to recognize that lack of diversity and I have to recognize that there isn't as much out there for my bees to be able to uh, gather to develop themselves and maintain their, uh, their health. So I'm very focused on, well, disease control for one thing. I look after my mites. I'm continual. I'm a man of assessment. I continually assess if there's a problem with mites and we, we do whatever we can to try to bring the mite counts down which overall helps with their health. And then I'm also very focused on uh, feeding patties, uh, supplements to be able to complement that pollen coming in. And uh, if I can just get a little bit of the pollen coming into the colonies, then I can drop that supplement on top and then they can use yeah. both together to build, develop these massive nests. And that allows me to then maintain uh, yards a little bit bigger a little bit closer all around the landscape, even though I'm losing a lot of those resources around me.
I want to close up one point here. Um, this is um, something I was going to ask you about, but a little later. We've been talking about the pollinator's plight, um, where the the peas are the problems that pollinators have today. You've got introduced pests and parasites. You've got um, poor nutrition, and you've got pesticides. Those are the big things, and we've talked about most of those. I just want to state that one of my biggest pet peeves is when I'm driving on the interstate in the summer and I pass a mowing crew on the median, there will be four or five or six big John Deere tractors with side mowers. And they actually put road tires on these tractors because they, they run them to death. And that makes me so mad to see that because I, I see thousands of acres that the taxpayers are paying to mow and maintain when all we need to do is let that grow up in trees or put a nice wildflower mix in it and you don't have to spend any more money on it past that 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 yeah, makes I mean, me so mad <laughs> i agree and it takes just just a little bit of a little bit of creative thinking i always argue with my municipality here because i don't allow them to excuse me i don't allow them to spray my ditches uh mm -hmm. you know it's complementing my property so i do have a little bit of control on that so i say uh turn the sprayer off as you go by here they're always complaining about that but i say if if you guys want to manage these ditches if if your objective is to manage the noxious weeds or the bulrushes because you're worried about water runoff on that um then do that you know as you're going by there's an oxygen weed or whatever, spray it. And I don't care, put double the up product on there if you want to control that spot. But when you go down the next mile and a half, don't spray all those beneficials out, right? Yeah. Or if you want to control the bulrushes, target on that, put all your effort into actually doing something instead of just going through with somebody on the sprayer with doesn't need to <clears throat> justify how they manage it. They're just going, they're just driving the truck, you know, and indiscriminately Bring this herbicide that's uh, killing all the beneficial plants and not really doing a damn of a difference with any of the, of the others. And just to make it look like you're doing something to manage this problem when actually you're not. If you would spend a little bit more thought process into this, invest a little bit more money. If, you know, if society really gives a damn, maybe they'd be more willing to invest more money into actually achieving some of these uh objectives that they want you know let's do that and then we'll have that uh that you know a healthier ecosystem because we have the diversity and then we're able to at the same time focus on those problems that we need to pay attention to so yeah. it takes effort <laughs> it, it, it <laughs> takes effort. effort but there are some easy wins out there there are some low-hanging fruit that if enough people cared and you know wrote a letter to their representative we could get something done about that you know we, yeah. we really we really could um i'm all about small victories too you know a whole bunch of small victories add up into something significant so if we can yeah. just keep pulling off those <clears throat> low-hanging fruit like you say and just focus on what we can actually grab a hold of right now and then we can build on top of that right but we have to be able to grab all those easy wins right off the start yeah. and then, then we can build on top yeah 